why don't we stand this evening for just a brief second. We're going to read the scripture. We are in Daniel chapter number 3. Daniel chapter number 3. We will read the first 12 verses together. Daniel chapter number 3. We are in a little series going through the stories in the book of Daniel, and we are, going, we are um, calling the series Living Right When Everything is Wrong. Um, as Christians, we understand what is going on around us in our society, and it's not always good, but um, that's, that's, that's happened throughout the Bible, and that's happened throughout many of time, and so... Um, as we look at things, we let's not get down that things are starting to change for the worse. Uh, let's make sure that we, who know the Lord, are doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we're going to look at Daniel chapter 3. What we're doing is we're looking through this many stories in the book of Daniel. And so we're going to look at part of this story this, this evening. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 1. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the providence of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providences to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providence were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the coronet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore at that time, when all the people had heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, so, uh, sackbuck, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said unto the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the coronet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not they, thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Let's pray. Father, I pray you would be with us this evening in these few minutes that we have as we look at this story. Lord, I pray it help us to, to learn some truths that we can apply to our life. And Lord, help us to gain confidence from the courage of these three young men. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, last week's story that we looked at on Sunday night ties in to this week's story. Last week in chapter 2, we saw that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed a dream and it troubled him and it bothered him in his soul. And uh, so he wanted to know what the dream was and what the interpretation of the dream was. So he went to all of his wise men and told them, you fellas are going to tell me the interpretation of my dream and you're also going to tell me what the dream is. And these wise men say, we, there's nobody that can do that. I mean, I mean, that's unreasonable. That's just an unreasonable request. And so um, he said, fine, I'm going to have all you guys killed. By the way, as you go through the book of Daniel, you kind of see that that's kind of how Nebuchadnezzar handles things. Um, and so he, he, he decides to have every single one of them killed, but 
Daniel hears about it because he's one of the wise men. He says, hey, don't be so hasty. He goes and talks to the king and says, give me a little bit of time and I'll, I'll, get, the, I'll get the answer you want. I'll, I'll figure out, the God will, I'll find the dream, the, the dream that you had and I'll give you the interpretation. And that's exactly what happens. Daniel goes back to his, with his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have a prayer meeting. God gives him the answer. He goes to King Nebuchadnezzar. He gives him the answer. Now, if you remember that answer, the answer was basically telling King Nebuchadnezzar, who was fretting about the future and what was going to happen in his kingdom and to the future of his kingdom. Uh, so God gave him, through Daniel, the, uh, uh, laid out to him the coming world leaders, the coming uh, uh, ruling powers that were going to take place. In this image that he saw in his dream, the image was made up of different, uh, of different materials. The head was made of gold, which represented uh, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, which would be, of all the ruling world kingdoms, Nebuchadnezzar will be, will be or would have been the strongest. The second was the arms and breasts made of silver, which represented the Medio persian Empire. The third was the belly and the thighs of bronze, which pictured the Grecian Empire, which was led by, of course, Alexander the Great. The fourth and final was the leg and iron, the legs of iron and feet and, 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 and of iron and the feet of iron and clay, which represents the Roman Empire. And then at the end, we in the dream, the, the image was destroyed by the kingdom of God, which would one day come forth when, when this world is over and God is ruling for all eternity. Now when we get into chapter 3, we see how it all ties together. Nebuchadnezzar comes in, and he was a very prideful man. We'll see in chapter 4 that God had to deal with him. So he decides to make his own image. Now his image is just a little bit different than the one God made. His image was complete gold. Now from the size of it, I'm sure it wasn't solid gold. It was probably made out of something and overlaid with gold. But his image was complete gold because he was trying to say that his kingdom would not end. Now, he also decides to turn this thing into not just a declaration that uh, he, does, he differs with God and God's interpretation of how the, the, the world powers are going to be, but he also makes it an object of worship. That's a problem. Uh, for the Jewish men that we've met already in chapters 1 and chapters 2, that's something they're not going to be able to live with. That's not something they're going to have to, that they would be able to comply with. And so now, because of his decree, they are in a direct line of fire. You see, at this dedication to the, uh, to, the, to the idol, they bring everybody in, and all the bigwigs are there, and they command them that whenever you hear the music, fall down and worship. And, by the way, if you don't worship, just let it be known you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. Well, that's not going to work. The first two weeks, we saw how Daniel and his companions had to stand up to some things in Babylon. In chapter 1, we saw the food that they knew they were going to have to eat as part of their training. And so they, in their wisdom, uh, dealt well with those that were over them and were able to say, listen, we understand what you're trying to accomplish here. Why don't you let us have a different diet? And then test us and see if everything works out uh, better. And they did that, and everything was fine, and so they were able to eat their own diet. Uh, in chapter 2, when everybody was going to be killed, Daniel went to him and said, why don't you give me a little bit of time and see if I can get you the answer? And he goes back and prays, and God gives him the answer, and he's able to, to, uh, to comply with what the king wanted without compromising his convictions. That's not going to happen in this chapter. That's not an option. Now they place an, uh, an idol in front of them and say, bow down and worship. If you don't, you're going to be killed. There's not a whole lot of wiggle room there. You see, the first two weeks, they, the first two stories we saw, they found a way to keep their convictions and also be able to, to, to comply with what needed to be done. Tonight we're going to look at it because you can't always work your way out of everything. There, co there came a time when it's like, you're not working your way out of this one, fellas. This one is going to involve you standing up and standing up for right. Next week, we're going to see how they end up in the fire. Today, we're going to look at what happened to put them in that line. 
It's interesting in the first two chapters, the key player is Daniel, of course, as he is throughout the whole book. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are kind of are kind of his companions. And by the way, whenever Daniel was promoted, what he did is say, hey, let's promote these three guys too. Unwittingly, in getting these men promoted, he's putting them in the line of fire of, of some people that are very jealous of their position. Daniel, in this chapter, is nowhere to be found. Where is Daniel? I, I don't know where he's at. Uh, I know that I know this. He probably was away on king's business, away from uh, the plains of Dura, because I know Daniel wouldn't compromise because he didn't compromise in the other stories that we're going to see later. But tonight, these men are right front and center. What did they do? Um, by the way, our, our first, whenever whenever we're faced with something, our first our, 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 that that goes against our convictions, our first our first line of defense or what we should do is find out if there is a way without compromising we can accomplish what wants to be accomplished. In other words, look, in the first chapter, all they were trying to do is feed them in and make them healthy. That's not a, that's not a, matter, of, you know, that's not a, a matter of worship. So he said, listen, why don't you try it our way and let's see if that works. And it did. But it's not going to happen this time. Sometimes we get ourselves in trouble before we get into what we're going to say tonight because as Christians, we are just nothing more than abrasive and rude. And I think sometimes we put people on alert because we make a big deal out of something that's not a big deal. But let me say this, uh, what we've done in Christianity, we've kind of flipped it and now we make something not a big deal that should be a big deal. And when it was a big deal, they had to step up. So we're going to see that. I want you to notice a couple things tonight. As we look at this story and we see that they have no choice, they're going to have to stand for right. First of all, I want you to see the direct challenge to God. What Nebuchadnezzar did was not some small thing. What he was doing in building this, this, this image was he was directly challenging what God had showed him before. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. Histori history tells us that probably this takes place about 16 or 20 years after his dream. But Nebuchadnezzar is getting more and more full of pride. By the way, he was a very strong king. He had a very strong kingdom. But when he made this idol, he was directly challenging God and his authority. What did he challenge? Well, first of all, he was challenging God's plan. God had already laid out the way that um, things were going to turn out. The key in the book of Daniel, the, the key verse is, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. And that's kind of what God is saying here, that God is always in control of everything. His providence, he knows what's going on, and, and, and anything that happens, he has allowed it to happen in his providence. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, I don't like your plan. I don't like that I'm just ahead of gold and that there's going to be another kingdom and another kingdom and another kingdom. I don't like that. So I'm going to make this image to say, my kingdom is going to last forever. I don't care what God said. He is challenging God's plan. How silly it is and what audacity it takes for somebody to have the guts and the gall to challenge God. But yet that happens all the time. People do that all the time. It's happening all over our world. We do it in subtle ways in our society. We're challenging God's plan for children and God's plan uh, uh, for the family. See, we... Uh, we are immoral in the face of God, and then when someone's immoral, they don't like the results of their immorality, what they do is they want to go and have the baby destroyed, as if it's the baby's fault. What are we, we're challenging God's plan. Oh, it's a lady's right. I believe, by the way, I do believe in ladies' rights. You have the right to choose in the first place whether or not you get pregnant. But once you get pregnant... The choice has been made. And I'm not saying this to condemn in a crowd our size. I'm sure there's someone in their past maybe didn't know the Lord. They got an abortion. I, I'm not saying this to, 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 to get on you. We're saved now. We know better. I'm just saying our society devalues life. Remember many years ago I was sitting in a, I was sitting in a, a break room when I worked at the warehouse and some guys were talking about abortion. And, of course, I'm the Christian. So, and and he, they asked me what I thought about it. And I told them, and they didn't like my answer. And he said, he goes, 
well, well, you know, what about these kids that are born and they're born in the poor family and all this stuff, uh, you, know, and, and, you know, or they're going to be born in this. They ought to be terminated ahead of time. I said, I got a better idea. We ought to go find children that are already born that are like that and let's get rid of them too. And he's like, well, well hey, oh, oh. I'm like, hey, there's not much difference. By the way, I like the Bible word when a lady's pregnant. You ready? Here's the phrase. With child. With child. It's a child. But we, we are all over. We, we don't like God's plan for marriage anymore. This is a big challenge in our day. Marriage always has been and always will be defined by God as a man and a woman. I, that's just, I mean, there's no way around that. All you guys are being unloving. I, no, we, we, don't, we, don't have, we don't have a, you know, look, if you want to get married and you want to get married in a blue dress instead of a white dress, and, uh, you know, if you want to have weeds up here instead of flowers, okay, that's your, that's your choice. God, you know, that's no big deal. Uh, if you want to come doing a handstand, go for it. Goofy, but don't go ahead. But if you want to come down the aisle with two men, God says no. There are, look, we can't, def we, we don't like what God says, and so in our society, we're, we're so confused now, Brother Bichard, we can't even tell what gender we are anymore. We don't like God's plan. By the way, let me say this about the gender thing. It started a long time ago. We started confusing the two in our roles and our responsibilities and who we are. By the way, you know, a lot of what's going on with that is people, because they're, they're trying to seek something without God, are confused about what they really are looking for, and, and, they're, and, they're look, and they're, they'll grab anything. And they're not satisfied with who they are. Look, be happy with who you are. I'm glad I'm a man and not a woman, Brother Ross. Although I could change if I wanted to now, legally. I'm glad. And by the way, if I was a woman, I'd be glad I'm a woman. Be glad who you are. It's funny, our says everybody always wants to be something else. The younger kids ought to be older, and the older adults want to be teenagers. I'm not a teenager, okay? You know, I was glad when I was a teenager. I was glad when I was a young married, and I'm glad when I'm a little bit older married. I'm not old, okay? I'm not, look, you're not going to see me on a surfboard or, or a, a skateboard trying to be cool. I am, look, be, why don't we just be happy with who we are? That was free. Thanks. Um, but God's plan. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like God's plan. Many people fight God's plan. Let's not challenge God. Why don't we let God be God? Why don't we get, let God? And sometimes, by the way, it's not even things like that. It could be trials or things that come into our life that we don't like. We don't like the way outcome and, and what's going on in our life. And, and God's like, why don't you just trust me? I have a plan for everything. Let's not fight him on this plan. But also... Nebuchadnezzar challenged God's power. We're going to see later on when he gets mad, he says, he says listen, uh, you guys are going in the fire and you better bow down. And who is that God? And he compares himself to God that's going to stop you. It's like, I'm in control here, guys. Uh, let me explain something to you, Nebuchadnezzar. No, you're not. That idol was saying, you know what? I'm in charge. Now, that sounds silly for us to have to talk about that in church, but let me say this. Um, there are two great gods of our age. Back in the day, the Bible day, there were many false gods that they would worship. Baal, Molech, uh, sun gods, all that, all, that, all that stuff. Today, we don't really do that very much. Now, they're false religion. I understand that. But we're really sophisticated in what we worship. Typically, our, our objects of worship are one of two things, money or self. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is worshiping self. He is setting himself up as a god. Now, let me say this, and I'll, I'll explain it quickly, and we're done with this point. When you set yourself up as a god, in other words, you're deciding what is right in your life. You're deciding what's going on without any input from God. That is Satanism. Satanism is not drawing a pentagram and sacrificing a kitten. That's not what it is. When I was in Bible college, I had a buddy who was out door knocking on his bus route. He knocked the door. They invited him in. It was dark in the house. I said, come on in. We'll talk. And he said, walked in the living room. The lights were out, and they had a pentagram and candles around. And they were having a little seance or whatever they were doing. He felt led of God not to hang around. Now, they weren't going to cut him or anything. That's, but, but that kind of stuff, that's bad, that's bad advertisement for Satan. He doesn't care. 
Satan's doctrine is in chapter 1 of Genesis. You be a God and you decide what's good and evil. You decide what's right and wrong for yourself. That's all Satan ever wanted. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. He's challenging God's power. How sad it is that Christians challenge God's power by trying to be the gods of their own lives. Why don't we just let God be God? Why don't we let God put the plan out there? Why don't we let God lead in our life? But I want you to see they're going to have a trouble here because there was a challenge. And I want you to see this, and maybe I'm making a little bit too much of it, but pray for me if I am. I want you to see Nebuchadnezzar's call to worship. He's having a worship service, Brother Pichardo. He got everybody together, all the big shots, and he says, we're having a worship service. Now, the verse 4, then a herald cried aloud, that's their preacher, to you it is commanded, O people and nation and languages. In verse 5, you hear the music, you fall down and worship. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace. The image is now not just a direct challenge to God. Now it's, a, now it's, an, it's, 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 an, it's an image of worship. I want you to notice the components of this false worship because they're everywhere in our society today. By the way, remember, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, one. There are many beliefs out there, but let me say this, they're not all right. I'm not saying that to be mean. Mentioned in my Sunday school class, somebody that came to, to Friend Day last Sunday wrote me a letter. And uh, it was typed out, not handwritten, and there was no return address, and it wasn't signed. And basically, they were calling me out. <laughs> they were saying, now, I'll get, before they, I'll probably tell you what they said, they did say that our church was very friendly, so thank you for that, okay? Um, they said, but even though your church is friendly, it doesn't mean that what you said wasn't wrong. But remember, I talked about Jesus last Sunday morning. We said there's only three things we can believe about Jesus. He's a liar, he's crazy, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. That's it. He didn't give us any other options. This person said there's a fourth option. It's all make-believe. Now, if that person would talk, I, that doesn't make me mad. Someone disagrees. That doesn't make me mad at all. But if they were to talk to me, I would tell them, you know what, your eternity kind of rests on this thing. You might want to do a little research on it. Just, just check it out. Try to find out what God really said. Come to your own conclusion. But this worship, there's some issues with it because we're going to get to it in, in a minute. Look, look at the first thing. First of all, there's going to be unity of beliefs. You see, in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, it's like he's got all these different people in his kingdoms. They're the ruling world power. And so when they would take over certain like they did and eat, like they did the Israelites, they brought the best of the best to live in their country to kind of implement them and have them become part of their society so that there'd be peace throughout the entire kingdom. And one thing he wanted to do, that's why he says all you different languages and nationalities, you're all going to worship the same image. Everybody's got to believe the same thing. Don't we see that today? You ever seen that bumper sticker, Coexist? And it has all the different religious symbols on it. Can I just tell you something? I'm all for coexisting. But there's no way we can have the same beliefs. There's no such thing as co-believing. All the different religions believe different things. There's no way to mesh them all together. And by the way, they can't all be right. If Brother Pichardo says, how do I get to the beach? And, and I say, uh, get on Pacific and go straight. You'll hit the water. And someone says, no, you go that way. No, someone says, no, you go that way. You're not going to hit the ocean going those other ways. You're going to have to follow my way. Not my way, but the right way, whatever one it was. His can be right, whatever. But see, all roads lead to the same place in religion. No, they don't. In fact, their beliefs aren't the same. Mormons tell you that your goal is to become a god and have your own planet. Now, let me just say something. If I was a god and had my own planet, and you lived on my planet, that would be frightening for you. You don't want me to be a god. I would have a really, really bad day. But there's all these different beliefs. Listen, they're, they're not all the same. You know, the, I don't care what the pope says. He wants to get everybody together and now bring the Muslims in, and we all believe the same. No, we don't. And by the way, someone's got to stand up and say it. We don't believe, I'm, are you against them? Do you dislike that? No, but their beliefs are different than ours. I just believe the Bible. 
We can't be unified. Well, let's just all get together. I know we used to rent the old church building up in Monterey Park, and, and the lady pastor up there from the Methodist church is like, oh, we all get together, and, 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 and all the different churches and religions, we get together and win the valley to God. Listen, they don't even, some of those don't even believe in God. We're, we're not going to make it. A unity of beliefs. That's what Nebuchadnezzar was saying. There's no way. Now Christianity is, alleged Christianity is starting to splinter. We have what we call the emergent church. The emergent church which says, listen, we need to back off on our beliefs because that's keeping people from God. Well, wait a minute. If you don't have beliefs, are they really coming to God? There are beliefs. We cannot, we cannot vacillate on what the Bible says. If the Bible says it, we have to stay with it. Well, you know, some people may not like when we say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. We better back off of that. No. It's the truth. If they don't have the truth, we're not helping them. In fact, we're false. There's a unity of beliefs. By the way, check out. Look, look. You better check out what other people, just because someone says they're Christian, just because something says it's a Christian church doesn't mean it is. There's this big popular uh, church, Hillsong, in, in, in Australia. Very popular. In fact, probably some of you listen to our music, and I wouldn't do that. Their doctrine is wrong. They don't even really believe in Christ. They had a big conference, and guess who their key convert was? Justin Bieber. He came and gave testimony at their conference of what God's doing in his life. Listen, if that's what God's doing in his life, I don't want it. But they sing pretty songs. What do they believe? Do they believe what the Bible says? That's the breaking point, people. If they don't believe what the Bible says, we got to back away. Unity of beliefs. That's what, never cares. We'll get everybody together. We'll all worship this image. We'll all sing Kumbaya, and the kingdom will have peace. And you know what they did? Everybody bowed down. But there was three guys that just couldn't do it. Ruined their worship service. You also see, and we won't spend time on this, his thing was deification of man. That's what he was doing. He was saying, I'm the one, I'm the boss. No, we won't spend time on that. I also want you to see, and pray for me on this one, there was a messenger of deceit. He had his own little preacher, the little herald. Hey, listen to me, people. When you hear the music, it's time to get on your knees. We're worshiping. We live in a time where people don't want to hear anything that goes against what they believe. We don't want to be challenged by the truth. I don't like to be lied to. In fact, I despise it. I don't. Occasionally, back in the early days of the church, when we had, we had some teenagers that were in, um, they would have some problems, and, and their parents were, would have trouble dealing with them. We had a couple of them that actually came to stay with us at certain times for a short time to kind of help them out. And... Uh, I always had a rule, Brother Ross, when they stay with me. It's like, listen, let me just say this. Uh, you're not going to lie to me. The first time you lie, you're done. I can't help you if you're a liar. Now, there was one person in there, and they did something, and somebody else narked on them. I pulled them in, talked to them. I said, now, listen, I'm going to ask you straight out. Just be honest with me. I can help you with this. We'll get through it. It's not a big deal, but you got to tell me the truth. Did you do this? No, no, I, I, I didn't do it. I always like this. I, you know, I was talking to so-and-so. Whenever you say that, their face kind of drops. I was talking to so-and-so, and they said you, you, you did do that. Oh, uh, uh, like you're done. I, I can't help you if you're going to lie to me. We have, why would you want someone to get up and teach you something that sounds good, but it's not true? Well, I think the Bible talks about that. Let me give you a verse in 2 Timothy. It says, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, and by the way, I believe this time is now, when they will not endure sound doctrine. In other words, we don't want to hear it. I just don't want to hear it. But after their own lust, which simply means desires, shall, shall they heap, excuse me, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears. You know what they want to do? I want to listen to someone that's going to tell me what I want to hear may not be good for me, but I just, I like to hear that. You know, the Joel Osteens of the world and these guys that they don't even believe the Bible talks about salvation. They don't believe that there's such a thing as sin. How are we helping somebody if we don't give them the truth? 
Well, let's just give them some little philosophy that makes them feel better. Let's pump up their inner uh, self-well-being. You want to have a good self-being? Understand who God says you are and let him do something great in your life. Understand who you are. So be careful. Who are we going to listen to? Many years ago, I was listening to a, a man on the radio. Uh, I was working many years ago, and it was a very well-known Christian guy, James Dobson, Focus on the Family. He had a show talking about salvation. By the way, what he said was not salvation. He had some weird thing, and he said, I pulled my son in, and I said, son, I, I hope you can hang on and one day make it to heaven. I'm like, why didn't you just tell him the gospel? Then he said this. He goes, and he's like, I know you're listening out there, and what do you have to do to go to heaven? He goes, go to church. Get baptized. That's a good start. I'm thinking, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible very clearly says, trust Christ. Oh, but he didn't want to get up and say, we're sinners. We need to trust Christ because that might have offended some of his donors. We need the truth. We ought to listen to people that give us the truth. And then I'll throw this in since we're probably not happy anyhow. We see the manipulation of music. What was the call to worship, Brother Pichardo? Music. They had six different instruments. It was going on. By the way, I like music. Now, I sing like someone that, uh, whose, whose voice has been ripped in half, okay? Uh, pray for me. So you, you want me to, I want, that's why I don't even lead, lead happy birthday, because it wouldn't be a happy birthday for anybody. It wouldn't be a happy birthday. I'm sorry. I can't, you know what? I wish if I could, if, it got, if God could give me one talent, brother, I would love to sing. But I'd probably get so proud, you know, and like, go get a toupee, do something. Can't sing. Can't sing. By the way, I wish they had rap music back before I was a, when I was a teenage, when, uh, when I was an unsafe teenager, because I could have sang rap. Okay. I saw, all you got to do is rhyme. Nothing to that. But can I just tell you something? They call music in the church today worship. It's not worship. It, lead, it can lead you to worship. But you know what? The music in our average church today is no different than what you listen to on the radio. It's about as shallow as a quarter inch of water. The type of music you listen to produces the type of person you're going to be. You go to the average rock and roll church, you're going to have people living a rock and roll lifestyle. I'm sorry. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't. Music is to honor God. And so you must have God honoring music. By the way, I, I love music when I when I, I still love music, but I, I like the wrong kind of music. Now, back in the, I didn't like rock, I didn't like rap or any of that. I was kind of a rock and roll kind of guy, and I went to concerts. And I can I just tell you something? That crowd was that crowd was in. Okay, you know, <laughs> you guys don't even know what that means. You know, you, you light the lighter and yeah, okay. That crowd was into whatever they were doing. Why? The music was moving them. The music isn't supposed to move our flesh. It's supposed to stir our soul for God. And if we have four words and we sing them 47 times, it's not moving anything. If it's, look, we could put a drum set and all that stuff in here, and man, you would move. And if we did, we'd play it right before the offering. Move that wallet right into that thing. Listen, we're not going to manipulate you with music. Music is to minister to our soul and get us in tune with God, not in tune with the flesh. But he used music. We'll stop there. And then the last thing is this. I want you to notice the charge they had to stand. What does, I, what does that mean? Well, these three young men were going to have to stand for God. There's just no way around it. If you have your Bibles, I want to read a couple of verses to you. Just flip over to Ephesians real quick. Ephesians, chapter number 6. I know we don't like to stand out. I know we don't like to, to sometimes people not like us because of our beliefs. I understand all that. I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to purposely have issues with individuals. And we're not looking for that. But, you know, there comes a time it's like right is right. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 10. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, 
that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. By the way, our problem is never individuals. And so this person, you know, look, that's, it's the truths or the, or the philosophies that they're espousing that makes it. And it's all a spiritual war, okay? But that's not. Our, our, ours is a spiritual war. Um, verse 13, wherefore... Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And then he says, and having done all, to stand. Do all you can. Put on the armor of God. But bottom line is, you're going to have to stand. You're going to have to stand. There comes a time when, listen, uh, that when truth is truth and right is right, and we're going to have to just say, this is right, I'm not budging on this. Everybody have a, every, by the way, everybody has a line in the sand. Just that some people are willing to move it back because they don't want to offend somebody. The, our line in the sand is the principles of God's word, and when you draw the line in the sand, it's like, I ain't moving. But the world is moving, and, and Christianity's moving. God hasn't moved. The word of God hasn't moved. I'm not moving. I'm going to stand. I want you to notice what it is. There was a command. Nebuchadnezzar gave a command that it wasn't an option. Everybody is to bow down. We see that they, they get up there and the herald says, all right, when the music comes, blah, 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 everybody go down. They play the music. Everybody drops to their knees. Why? They were commanded to. It was not an option. So many people just follow the crowd, as we mentioned this morning. Whatever the crowd is doing, that's what we're going to do. We judge our actions by looking around. What is everybody else doing? We're not supposed to do that. Remember this, the majority is usually wrong. Those that do right are usually in the minority. When we do like everything else, the Bible has the phrase for us. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. What does conform mean? Pressed into a mold. You're just like everybody else. The Bible tells us, don't do that. We're not, the, you know the mold we're supposed to be compressed into? Jesus Christ. Conformed into the image of his son. We can't be like everybody else. You notice these three men as they're looking around and they're standing there and they're here and there. Because, by the way, these weren't just guys. These were leaders. They were workers in the providence. Nebuchadnezzar knew these guys. And they're sitting there and here's all these thousands of people and, and they're standing there and it's like, it's you know, they know it. it's coming. It's coming. You know, doo -doo 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 -doo. all the music starts to play, blah, 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 yeah, whatever it is. And then everybody drops down. Could you imagine the sight? This vast crowd, and in unison, they all go down. Except for three. They stand out like a sore thumb. Like, they're, they're like, uh-oh. Command. We can't be like everybody else. Why are you Christians so different? We're not trying to be different to be antagonistic. We're different because God tells us how we're supposed to be. And if we're being the way God wants us to be, we're going to stand out. By the way, you ought to stand out. There's a lot of people that won't like it, but I'll tell you this. There's a lot of people that look at you if you're standing out for the right, and in their heart they're like, I wish I had some of that. Or maybe they don't understand it now, but there's going to come a time in their life when the way they've gone, they're starting to have emptiness, and they're going to say, you know that Christian at work? Seems like things go good for them. I wonder what that's all about. Stand. And I want you to see the consequence. He said, Whoso falleth not down in worship shall be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace. You know, Nebuchadnezzar just was kind of like out there. That's just kind of how he did it. You do what I say, everything's good. You get a vacation to Hawaii. But if you don't, you're dead. It's like there's no middle ground with him. There's always going to be consequence. See, in our society, what we're trying to do, we're trying to legislate now beliefs. I always thought this was America. We had a right to believe as we choose. That, but, and by the way, you know whose beliefs they're trying to legislate? Ours. Christians. I guarantee you. 
some of the stories and things I heard where the government gets on Christians, if they asked them why they didn't do that and they said that they were Muslims instead of Christians, they wouldn't say a word to them. I just don't understand what's going on. But they don't, they don't, there's consequences. By the way, Hillary said at, uh, she was meeting at a thing that had to do with abortion, and she was talking about how things had to change. And she talked about religious beliefs, and they have to, we have to, and she said, we, if we have to force them to change. That's where it's heading. If we don't get in line like everybody else, they're going to try to legislate it out of us. Oh, you don't believe in, in, in gay marriage? We'll, we'll come after your business. We'll try to get you that way. I'm just telling you, there's going to be consequences. Are we willing to put up with it? The world gets angrier and angrier and angrier every single day. You can disagree with somebody kindly, but they, they, emotions get into it. And people just get angry. There's a man named Richard Dawkins. He's an atheist. He's very angry at God. He believes, he wrote a very popular book called The God Delusion. He believes that if you believe in God, you're not just wrong, you're dangerous. He said this about America, and this is how silly and idiotic his claims are. He said that America's love for religion is hindering her scientific advancement. Now listen to his own admission. He says, um, beyond any doubt, America is the world's leading scientific power. Now he admits that. Throughout history, there has never been anything like modern America as a leader of science. What's remarkable is that America is the leading scientific nation despite being held back by the incubus this burden of ignorance and superstition talking about belief in God. He is so angry he can't even see that what he just said contradicts what he just said. He said there's never been an a, a advanced society like America and they're held back because they believe in God. Now, 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 now that's looking at facts and seeing what you want to see. If I were to spin it, I would say, what's the leading technological or scientific nation in the world? America, okay. What country, I know we're not perfect, believes in God more than anybody else? America. Hmm. He sees the opposite. No, no, no. You'd be even better off. I guess if we didn't believe in God, we'd probably have flying cars by now. Teletransporters. We look at things through our lens, and we get angry if you don't believe like we believe. You see these colleges where they have these debates where you have an atheist come and they'll debate a Christian. And, and if they don't like what the Christian's saying, they'll start yelling and screaming to shout them out so they don't have to hear them anymore. Boy, that's truth. Whatever happened to exchange of ideas? Because if you don't get in line with everybody else, you've got to be stopped. That's what they thought. thought. And then I want you to notice the last thing we're done, the charge. What happened, some of the Chaldeans, these, these other leaders, who were jealous of the position, particularly, because we see it later in the book, that these three guys had, they saw them. So they go to King Nebuchadnezzar and say, hey, you know, there's, there's some guys in your kingdom, and they don't regard you, which wasn't true. They were very respectful to Nebuchadnezzar. They don't regard the gods you made. These guys are different. They're troublemakers. By the way, I, I hope if I ever get an accusation, I'm a troublemaker because I believe in God. Not that I'm causing trouble, but they say, your beliefs are a hindrance and they get on me for that. That would be great, wouldn't it? At least I believe something. Acts 5.29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The world will never respect us. Now, we'll see what happens next week. And we'll see that Nebuchadnezzar starts to change his mind because these men stood. But we're never going to, we're never going to make an impact if we keep backing off. What was it? A year and a half ago, uh, Chick-fil-A came out and said, we're for traditional marriage. By the way, they got hammered for it in the media. There's places that don't want the, There are cities they've tried to build Chick-fil-A's, Chick and they haven't let them. The city has stopped them simply because of that belief. But wait a minute. It's changed. They started taking the heat, so you know what they did? They quit giving money to some organizations that were for traditional marriage. And they started giving marriage money to gay organizations. They've changed. 
They backed off. Christians do that all the time. And you know what I, you know, I've said it over. Let's not be mean to people, but we can't change what we believe. We don't have that option. We don't have the, look, there were other Jews in that crowd that dropped to their knees as soon as they heard the music. They may have thought, well, you know, what's the big deal? I still believe in God, you know, and, and, and if I'm dead, I can't do any good. These three guys go, we don't have an option. God says you, you, you don't worship anybody else. Don't bow down to a graven image. I can't do it. What's the point? The point is this. We need to stand correctly for God. Have some beliefs. Know what the Bible says and live by it. And the Bible does tell us, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And they did that in the first two chapters. But you know the third chapter? They couldn't do it. We live in rough times, but don't let what's going on out in the world change what you believe. Don't do it. Let's stick with what God said. Don't let, by the way, we're never going to let what's going on in the world change what we believe in here. That's never going to happen. Never. We're going to stick with the Bible. We're going to stick with truth. I hope that you will do the same. Let's stand tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed.